The Sony PlayStation 3 has a reputation for being a difficult machine to develop games on. Gabe Newell, the president of Valve, hated the PlayStation 3, calling it a frustrating architecture and a waste of everyone's time. There's nothing here that you're going to apply to anything else. You're not going to gain anything except a hatred of the architecture that they've created, he said. Harsh words indeed. In the end, Valve let Electronic Arts handle the PlayStation 3 port of the Orange Box, which turned out to be a less than stellar port with sluggish frame rates. But on the other side of the spectrum, we saw masterpieces such as Uncharted 2, The Last of Us, and Gran Turismo 5 that looked and ran amazingly well and still hold up even to this day. Yet many of the cross-platform Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 games seem to run worse on the PS3 for no real apparent reason. Was the system hard to develop for, or was there something else going on? Let's try to answer that by first taking a look at the architecture and comparing it to the Xbox 360, which had a reputation for being easy to develop games for and ran code faster. The Sony PlayStation 3 utilizes the cell architecture that was made famous due to its prominence in parallel computing. By utilizing multi-cores, lots of threads could be spawned to achieve amazing results with a single processor. The PS3 CPU is known as the PPE or Power Processing Element and it was a power PC based chip that ran at 3.2 GHz with two hardware threads. In comparison, the Xbox 360 also has a power PC based CPU and also runs at 3.2 GHz. Known as the Xenon processor, it can have up to six hardware threads. Now you're probably thinking, two hardware threads compared to six? Well this isn't a fair fight. Surely, the Xbox 360 would destroy the PlayStation 3 in performance, but this is not the full story. As it turns out, the PS3 also has seven additional processing units known as Synergistic Processing Elements or SPEs. This is the secret weapon of the PlayStation 3 architecture. These SPEs have different usage scenarios, but in general they were used for running optimized parallel mathematical calculations. So for example, they would be used to manage things like cloth physics or particle updates. A game like Super Stardust HD calculated the collisions and physics of all objects on screen and ran at a lock 60 frames per second. And without the help of the SPEs, this would have been extremely difficult. On the other hand, the Xbox 360 through each of its cores has access to additional high performance floating point vector operations utilizing the processor extensions known as VMX128. Moving on to the GPUs, the PlayStation 3 has the RSX from Nvidia, while the Xbox 360 uses the ATI designed Xenos chip with both chips clocking in at 500 MHz. So, back in 2005 and 2006 when the Xbox 360 and then later PlayStation 3 was released, a 3.2 GHz multi-core CPU sounded like a massive leap in performance of an upgrade as compared to the original Xbox, which was a single core 733 MHz processor, and the PlayStation 2 was the Emotion Engine, which ran at 300 MHz. I remember when I moved on to homebrew development on the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 after the days of the OG Xbox, I was originally very underwhelmed with the performance on both systems. It didn't feel like a 3.2 GHz CPU, and I wondered if there was something that I wasn't doing properly. It turns out, I just needed to think differently. Both the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 were designed with graphics as the big push. This was the HD era, and high-performing GPUs with fast graphics memory were available on both the PS3 and the Xbox 360. But in order to keep the cost of both consoles down, sacrifices needed to be made somewhere, and in both cases, it was the CPU. Although both systems ran a 3.2 GHz multi-threaded processor, both the Xenon and Cell processors were crippled. To elaborate further, both processors do not support what's known as out-of-order instruction execution. This is something that's almost standard on all PC-based processors, but it was removed on the consoles to reduce cost. If we consider these three lines of code, modern CPUs are designed to minimize any delay on instructions that don't have dependencies and execute them first. In this example, the second instruction that adds 2 to the variable x cannot run until the first line is finished. However, the assignment of y on the third line could be moved above the first line as there is no dependency on it. And this is what an out-of-order CPU would likely do. 
The bottleneck with the cell and xenon processors is that the CPU is not capable of reordering instructions. So here the third line must wait for the second instruction to complete before initializing Y. This example may not sound like a big deal, but what if there were two functions that first did a complex math calculation and the second was some basic addition? The code would run the complex math calc first and then perform the basic addition. An out of order processor would most likely optimize this flow in order to minimize any stalls in the pipeline. There was also performance penalties on wrong branch prediction and even worse, a CPU pipeline stall known as a load hit store. This is when you store a value in a memory location and retrieve it too soon after. These three limitations on the CPU alone would mean that code would run significantly slower than expected without developer optimizations. On the Xbox 360, some of these limitations could have been mitigated simply by breaking code out and utilizing one of six hardware threads available. Multi-threading, fast L1 cache, and a large amount of bandwidth really help the Xbox 360's performance. On the PlayStation 3 with only two hardware threads, it meant utilizing the seven available SPEs to offload code to. The problem was these SPEs were difficult and needlessly complex. Understanding how they worked would be tricky. Every developer has to start somewhere and usually it's with a Hello World program. But what if we wanted to write a Hello World program that ran under one of the SPUs? This is where things start to get complex. And this example will outline the complexity of the development. The code will allocate one of the seven SPUs and then create a thread group to run under. And once the thread group is created, the SPU thread is created to run in that group. With the thread created, an event queue then must be created to handle the output of the SPU. In this case, our Hello World output. This event queue is then attached to the PPU thread that's currently running to handle the event output. And finally, the SPU thread group is started so that the SPU can send its Hello World output. And of course, we must clean up the SPU thread at the end of execution. Something that traditionally would take three to five lines of code needs around 144 lines of code to receive a simple Hello World text output from one of the SPUs. TLDR, the learning curve to utilize and take advantage of the SPEs was large. The complexity was one of the main reasons why the PlayStation 3 games did not perform as fast as the Xbox 360 equivalents. On paper, the PlayStation 3 has more power than the Xbox 360, but most ports ran weaker on the PlayStation 3. Generally speaking, the reason for this goes back to time. In this age of cross-platform development, larger AAA releases are under tight deadlines. And because the PS3 and Xbox 360 share the same PowerPC architecture, it meant code was generally portable across both systems. However, while both systems share common elements, the PlayStation 3 in reality was quite different to the Xbox 360. If a game development started either on a PC or an Xbox 360, which many cross-platform games did, then it was necessary to re-engineer aspects of the game to run well on the PS3 to take advantage of the SPEs, which would require additional effort. And this was a common complaint by many developers. Usually, they were up against deadlines to deliver. The steep learning curve of making use of the SPEs meant project target deliverable dates would be put at risk. In the worst case scenario, some games did not even bother to utilize the SPEs and resorted to the PPE and RSX only. The Orange Box was a famous example of this. Electronic Arts early Madden titles also struggled to run at good frame rates. They were direct ports from the Xbox 360 or PC with no SPE optimizations. In the media, the PlayStation 3 was getting a reputation for being a difficult machine to develop for. However, middleware tools like Havoc, a very popular physics and pathfinding API, started to take advantage of the cell SPEs and took the burden away from the developer. Sony also encouraged developers to take advantage of the SPEs even in public forums. It took time, but the results paid off, especially during the last few years of the Sony PlayStation 3. We saw some amazing games that pushed the hardware to its limits. But I think the last word should go to Sony. Then CEO Kaz Harai even admitted that Sony did not want to make it easy on the developers on the PlayStation 3. It's hard to program for, and a lot of people see the negatives of it. But if you flip that around, it means the hardware has a lot more to offer. But unfortunately, that's really the end of the story here because with the current generation of home consoles like the Xbox One X and PlayStation 4, PlayStation 4 Pro, a 
almost identical set of architecture is used in both systems. So the ability for developers to extract the best performance out of the individual systems has really diminished these days because for all intents and purposes, both systems are identical other than you know the, the underlying kernel and firmware that, that runs these systems and some slight differences in things like memory bandwidth and you know CPU speed and performance, but there is nothing that's kind of distinguishable between the PlayStation 4 Pro and the Xbox One X that, that makes one system far superior than the other or some secret weapon that particular system has that the other one doesn't. Now you could say it's really a good thing in order to streamline game development and get things out multi-platform all on the same day with as little additional optimization as necessary. But in another way, it's not a good thing because developers really, if they spent the time, the time that you put in to learning a system, a new architecture, you are rewarded with some amazing performance. And the best example of that would be the Uncharted series. If you look at the differences between Uncharted 1 and Uncharted 3, there was a massive leap in performance and visual quality overall because Naughty Dog themselves admitted that they were using maybe 30% of the SPEs in the development of Uncharted 1, whereas they were pretty much maxing out things by the time Uncharted 3 and The Last of Us were launched on the PlayStation 3. So unfortunately, those types of things don't seem to be around anymore with current gen consoles. And it doesn't seem like it's going to continue going into the next generation as well because I've, we've already heard reports about similar specifications on both the Xbox Scarlet hardware as well as the PlayStation 5. Well guys, I'm going to leave it here for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you liked this video, you know what to do. Leave me a thumbs up and let me know what you thought about it in the comments below. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.